<laughs> and you are absolutely right, Jesus is. In fact, you took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to say, I so appreciate your uh, meditation that it, it really does just tie into everything that we've already experienced in worship this morning and then also the message that uh, we've been given a great gift. We, Paul's going to remind us today that we have a great gift that has been given to us, and, and we ought to respond in kind. As Jesus sacrificed himself, we are to be sacrificial in our living as well. But with that in mind, let's read. We're going to take a look at this idea of spiritual gifts today. Remember, this is a series on miracles, and I promise you we're eventually going to get to miracles. Uh, probably the first Sunday in August is where we're looking at, because next week we're going to have David Kaiser in. April and I are going to be in Chattanooga. And then the Sunday after that, Alan Pearson's going to be here. And I'm going to talk more about that, about how you can connect with him while he's here. Everybody know who Alan Pearson is? Yep, you guys have been support. He says this is the church that has uh, been his uh, longest tenured supporter, which is uh, pretty incredible. So we're looking forward to him and his wife being here on the 30th. They're going to He's going to preach during the morning service and, and preaching. He's going to do more of a presentation, but then he wants to do a demonstration. And it's all about the idea of storying, which is a very uh, good uh, missional tool, not only overseas, but in our world uh, here. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that. I've, I've known about storing. We've done storying. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, him present that to us. But as we look at this idea of spiritual gifts, Romans 12, 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If service, use it in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving with generosity. Leading with diligence. Showing mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We pray your blessings on it. And I pray for your blessings upon your messenger today. That I would be surrendered to you. Lord, allowing your spirit uh, speak through me. Uh, the words of truth of this passage, and then, Father, for all of us, may we have open hearts to receive it uh, into our lives, and, Father, to allow it to change us, transform us, and move us into a closer, deeper walk with you in the way we live our life. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You know, I read through this list, and, and there's four lists. I'm, you're probably going to get a repeat of this a little bit throughout the sermon, but there's four lists of spiritual gifts found in the New Testament, a lot like to go to this one because they say Paul gives explanation to the gifts. He kind of defines them. But I chuckle because in our English, our translation, you know, if I say I'm going to describe this to you, I, I think I told that story one time before. There was a young guy that was leading some worship for a revival we were having in Missouri, and, and he stood up and he goes, you know what the word hallelujah means? And we're all like, he goes, Hallelujah. <laughs> And I kind of get that same idea here, you know, uh, if prophecy used according to proportion of faith. I don't know that I get all that. If service, what are we supposed to do? Serve. <laughs> it's not rocket surgery, is it? Teach, teach. Exhort, exhort. But I think we need to know what those words mean, and that's what we're going to uh, take a look at. But to get there, we have to uh, understand why Paul is putting this here, and, and uh, a lot of theologians they will think about chapter 11 being kind of the end of Paul developing his theology, and then 12 through the end of the Romans is more of his, now how do you implement it? How do you carry it out? How do you put it into practice? Ah, <clears throat> excuse me, I would argue that, that he continues to develop his theology throughout the rest of the book, and, he, he, and, and I, what I love about it is that he, he not only gives us what the, uh, our, our correct understanding of the doctrine should be, but how it is that we are to live it out. But he ends that section of the, his letter to the church in Rome, uh, and we would call it chapter 11. Uh, and at the end of chapter 11, and that's why I read that hymn of praise there at the beginning, and I just want to refer back to that, and especially the one line, for from him and through him are all things. 
To him be glory forever. Amen. So, for from him and through him are all things. We need to keep that as a base understanding in our spiritual walk with him and the things that we do in our life. That we have nothing apart from what God's given us. We do nothing apart from what God wants to do through us. Now, we all know that we get things other ways, that we do things apart from God. But I want to tell you, those things that have eternal, lasting measures, impact, are the things that we will discover and understand that it all comes through him. In other words, this is Paul getting us, and he's going he's to really address it here in just a few minutes, about us being humble. You know, uh, truly, outside of Christ, we are nothing, and we have nothing, and we have nothing to give. But when we are in Christ, we have everything to give, and God is wanting and willing to do that through us. And I think it is this hymn of praise, this for from him and through him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. And he is established, and just as the writer Hebrews established, Jesus is the better way. Jesus is the uh, yeah, he went to sleep on me. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, mine are still too. Anyway, uh, he he uh, Je- he just makes much of Jesus and what and, and what we are to do. And so he starts this. If we're going to talk about him now, telling us how to live it out, and, it, and it's a good word that he uses there in chapter twelve. He says, "Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, he's going back. We have been given this great gift of Jesus because of the mercy of God." He says, "Present your bodies as living sacrifices." We are just to follow the example of Jesus. We are to live as living sacrifices unto him. Now, we're going to take a minute to understand what that means. Holy, pleasing to God. And he says, this is our true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We need to know that we surrender ourselves. We uh, we, we live sacrificially, and we sacrifice ourselves so that God can come and, and transform us, and, and in that transformation will cause us the desire not to be conformed to the world and its ways anymore, and then God will, we will know, and here's the great thing, we will know what is pleasing on him. We will be able to discern what is good and pleasing and the perfect will of God. Oswald Chambers says this, we have the idea that we can dedicate our gifts to God. Remember, we don't have anything, only from what God. He goes on to say, we have the, uh, however, you cannot dedicate what is not yours. There's actually only one thing you can dedicate to God, and that is your right to yourself. If you give God your right to yourself, he will make a holy experiment out of you, and his experiments always succeed. The one true mark of a saint of God is the inner creativity that flows from being totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but that excites me when I hear that. If I surrender to him and I give my life, uh, the creativity, I love how how Oswald Chamber, the creativity of Jesus Christ will flow through us. Remember, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. And so Jesus was at the beginning of creation. And so the God that spoke creation into being and created all the things that he did, the diversity of it, I mean, just take a minute and think about nature. Think of your favorite places where you'd like to be and look around the room, all the creative, unique people that he uh, uh, has, has created and given his, his breath of life to. He's going to take all of that energy if you're a surrendered, sacrificial follower of his and work that creativity through you. I I hope you capture that picture. I I mean, honestly, it's just inside, it it moves me deeply to think that the one who spoke and said, let there be light, is saying to me, if I will surrender my life to him, he will do that same creative work through me. Now, not that I'm going to go out and I'm going to start speaking, let there be light, or let there be darkness, or let, let there be desolation, or any of these things. But what I do know is that he has, he has called me into a relationship by his mercy. I bring nothing to the table. I bring absolutely nothing to the table. But by his mercy and grace, he now says, I want to do 
incredible things in your life more than you could ever imagine. We need to just know that a surrendered life will be evidenced by the transformation of life, by a transformed life of a believer, a life that does not conform to this world. We don't give into the ways of this world. We don't try to fit into this world. What we do is we continue to let God lead, guide, and direct us, and we live out his kingdom in this world. That's a sacrificial life. And let me tell you, when you start living that way, it will be sacrificial. There will become isolation, rejection, maybe even persecution. But at the end of the day, you will know that it is the best place for you to be. You will be fulfilled and you will be satisfied. A sacrificial life is one that uh, commits itself to spiritual growth and maturity in Christ. And out of this commitment, out of sacrificing to this uh, process, we will discover our place and our function within the body of Christ. And the purpose that we do that is so that we will build a unified body of Christ. This is, this is why we have the need for spiritual gifts, to provide for us what is needed to build a unified body of Christ. We're going to understand that, that God is the one that fitted us together. He brought us together. And I want you to just pause for a minute because right now, I know that you're thinking of a lot of people that should be here. Um, maybe you're thinking of some people you wish weren't here. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, you need to know God fitted us together. That's no accident. And I know there's been a lot of ups and downs. We've all experienced those. Uh, your church has had some difficult days in the past, uh, but you are moving forward and you're continuing to pursue him. And I think it's, it's awesome. And I'm glad to be a part of that journey. And I believe God has fitted us together to carry out his purpose and will. Now we do that together using these gifts in a unified way. Paul makes some of those statements here right out of the gate before he really gets to the list of gifts. In verse 3, we're told about the grace. He said, and, and what I would want you to understand, if you are a follower of Christ, then you have experienced his mercy and grace. And you know, even, even if it's not something that's being uh, developed right now or practiced, you, you can think back to that time that you committed yourself to him and you knew that you were receiving such great mercy and the grace was just overwhelming. It, this idea of grace, by the way, we can't earn grace. Remember, he's the giver of all things. Uh, we just have to keep that concept is that God gives, we receive. And so it's not anything, we didn't earn it, we can't uh, work for it, we don't get it by merit, we don't get it by heritage. Uh, this is one of the things the Israel nation kind of missed, is just because I'm born a Jew, I'm in. It doesn't work that way. Just because you're born into a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian. These are decisions and choices that we have to make to receive what he's offering us, what he's wanting to give us. Again, nothing we bring forth. You know, when we understand this, and with this knowledge, and, and this knowledge of this overwhelming gift, Paul says one of the things you need to make sure you do with it is to always be humble. This, these are those phrases, not to think too highly of oneself. It literally means, it, 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 and I don't know why writers choose different words, but literally from the translation it means do not be haughty. Do not be haughty. That's kind of like my Calvary and Calvary, isn't it? Anyway, don't be stuck up. Don't be proud. Don't be a leak. Don't, you know, and, and I've done it myself. You know, I, in trying to help understand things in the world, and, and I look at, at some of the trouble and struggles, and in an attempt not to be judgmental, I become judgmental. And I'll say, well, they're just doing what lost people do. That is such a proudful, elitist statement. It's true, right? Apart from Christ. But, but by the grace of God, there go I. That's what we've got to remember. And, and I am so, I'm, I'm trying to work hard on that in my life. I'm trying to work hard on, on, on not just excusing sin, uh, but also not putting a spin on it that makes us look so much better. The only reason we're better is because of Jesus. And we have a better way. But it doesn't make us any better than anyone else. And that's what Paul's trying to get. Don't think too highly of yourself. We're to think sensibly. And that word sensibly here in this passage literally means to pursue a righteousness and a godliness. This, 
Every day, this is what we ought to be pursuing in our lives. And he also says we have all been given a measure of faith. This is really going to come back to play when we look at the gift of prophecy. He says as to one, as in proportion to one's faith. It's just a reminder, we've all been given the same faith, the same measure. He doesn't pick people out and give them extra measures of faith. Now, we may look at them, and, and I know people where I go, man, I wish I had their faith. But that's because of their growth and their maturity. But for all of us entering into the kingdom, uh, you'll hear this again later, there's no special status within the body of Christ. We are all equal. We are all equal. That's, and that's why we address this understanding of being unified. And that's who Paul says we have to be individually. He also addresses who we are to be corporately. We are members, verses 4 through 5, we are members one to another, fitted together by God. God has fitted us together for one another. You know what? If we'll understand that, if you think about putting a puzzle together, if a piece is missing, I mean, it's an old corny uh, illustration, but it works. What do you do when, you're, when that piece is missing, by the way? One, you go looking forever. Got to be somewhere. Where did Hercules take that piece of puzzle? You know, I am looking everywhere. All but one place. I don't really care if you ate it. You know, if it is, it's gone. Some of you will get that on the drive home later. So what we do, though, if we don't find the piece, we just tear it up and, and put it back in the box. And then we throw it away. It is vital that we have that piece. And it is vital that we understand that each and every one of you is important to having a unified body here. And it's not good when you're not here. Now, listen, don't hear me talking about, like, vacations, getting away. We're going to Chattanooga. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we aren't going to be always all together. But what I'm saying is we need to be committed. And we need to know that we are a part of this body and that we belong. And we need to bring who we are and what God has gifted us to do into this body for the purpose of building the body up and being unified in what we do. We really do need each other. And as we walk through this list of gifts, that are given to us as a grace gift from God, we're to use them for one another to pursue sacrificial living, spiritual growth, and maturity. Now, the most asked question I get when I speak about spiritual gifts, whether it's in a sermon or it's a Sunday school or a training or wherever, is people want to know, how do I discover my gift? How do I discover my gift? Now, this doesn't work like gifts that I get for April. Christmas time, she takes the catalog, she dog ears the page, circles it, you know, and that's what she gets. It is, tr well, it used to happen. It doesn't happen so much anymore. But here's the deal. What I would do is I would look at that and go, hey, I know what she wants. So I go out and I'll pick out something like that, right? And I bring that. And she goes, what's this? <laughs> I go, well, I thought you would want me to put a little bit of effort into it. <laughs> no, your effort's going and buying it and wrapping it up which I didn't do very good either. So I learned that all I needed to do was just it, you know, follow the instruction. Now, we don't discover it that way. We don't get it that way. April can't say to God, look, here's the spiritual gift I want. I've dog-eared it. I've circled it. Please give me this spiritual gift. Not one like it, but that spiritual gift. It's not up to us. God is the one who discerns. God is the one who decides. God is the one who determines what our gift is going to be. We can't find it. We can't discover it. There's no assessment that's going to really accurately tell us what that gift is. It's going to tell us what our proclivities are, what our traits are, uh, what we lean in, uh, towards. And I think God works in all of those things to uh, elevate the gifting that he gives us. But he is the one who determines what gift you give. And by the way, it's not for a lifetime. Maybe. It's not necessary for a lifetime because you may find yourself in a dis different situation or environment where there's an, a need for a different kind of gift. And it is up to God to determine when he gives you gifts and how he uses them. And by the way, when he gives it to you, you're going to know. You will know. If you're walking with him, if you're, if you're committed to uh, uh, spiritual growth and maturity, you're going to be able, as Paul tells us at the first part of, of Romans, you will, you will know, you'll be able to discern what is pleasing and good and right unto the Lord. 
And so he'll give you that gift and, because it'll be overwhelming. You won't be able to help yourself. Uh, I've told you the story before about a staff member uh, that had the gift. I, clearly, one of the guys I've seen had a gift of evangelism. He can talk to any stranger and they enter into it. I talk to a stranger, they're running, right? And so he had that ability and God used that and he just had a knack about himself. Uh, but it was God at work in his life and, and, and we, we will recognize and he, he knew that. I've already mentioned there are four spiritual gifts, or list of gifts, not four spiritual gifts, so a whole lot more than that. Before list, we find in the New Testament, here the one in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, which is the largest, Ephesians 4, and then 1 Peter 4. But I like this list because what Paul does, and even though I made a little bit of fun of it at the beginning, he gives explanation to the gifts. He really helps us to understand. In other places, Paul gives some warnings and discussion and, and direction, but this, I think, is getting our toe into the water, helping us understand. I think that's what Paul's trying to do is to say, hey, we are a special called out group of people who have been fitted together for the purpose of uh, uh, unifying the body uh, that will encourage one another uh, to spiritually grow and mature and serve the kingdom. And he takes this list and he helps us understand, look, you don't have to do it alone. And isn't that the great news? I mean, that should be worth celebrating right now. It's not up to us. God's not sitting up, up there going, you guys figure it out. Figure it out. He, we don't have to do that. He's got to figure it figured out. What we just need to do is make sure we're surrendered to that, to him. And so Paul lists these gifts and he gives explanation in verses six through eight. And what this will help us to do is we, it'll help us to understand what our function is within the body of Christ and the fact that it is determined by the grace gift given to us. In other words, as we're fitted together, as we know what our gift is, we bring that and we're fitted together, we will live it out. The first one is prophecy. Prophecy, it is understood as one who speaks for God for the purpose of preparing the body of Christ for service. Now, a lot of people like this uh, gift prophecy. They think it gives them an, uh, a blank check to go out and say whatever they want. God has laid this gift of prophecy on me, so I need to go out here and declare to the world what it is that God is saying. And usually it comes out as judgment, uh, accusations. Uh, 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 it's, it's usually just filled with anger. Uh, in fact, I was driving in uh, Thursday morning to a breakfast meeting behind a semi, big old sign on it that said, have you prayed today? And that kind of lifted my spirits. I thought, well, you know, it's a good reminder. And I thought, well, I just said a little prayer, you know, but have I really prayed today? But then I, my eyes went up, and above it was a bigger picture of a really angry-looking face and a finger pointing at me, and, and my whole attitude changed because it was like, have you prayed today? That's not going to do anything. You know, I don't want to pray to that guy's gods, let me say that. And oftentimes we take this idea of prophecy of saying that's what we've got to do. We've got to be like those Old Testament prophets that are crazy and weird and, and going out and pronouncing the judgment of God. It doesn't happen in the New Testament. It changes. Our purpose is to prepare the body of Christ for service. Oftentimes we attribute this gift to preachers and think that's left for them. But if we understand the New Testament prophets and those who claim to be the prophet in the New Testament, what they did is they worked alongside the apostles. They worked alongside the pastors. They worked alongside the teachers for the purpose of preparing the body of Christ for service. Let me give you an example. Her name was Marguerite Brandon. Great lady. We love this lady. Uh, she was in our church in Missouri. Uh, great Sunday school teacher. Uh, great servant. Uh, just all around, just one of the kindest ladies you'd ever meet. Our church was grown. We needed to build an addition. We were talking about how to do that. And the best way was for us to take our present church the way it was, literally inside and flip it around. So it would be like if we took this and flipped and made that the front of the sanctuary. Oh, my goodness. You should have heard the discussion that was going on. Oh, this church was built this way. This church has always been this way. This is, you know, it's going to change the looks of it so much. You know, it, it reminds me of a business meeting I was in where it took 45 minutes to discuss how the bushes were going to get trimmed outside. Now, not at that church. It was at a totally different church. And it was at that point that I committed to not go to any more business meetings at that church. <laughs> Just go trim the bushes, right? We can't, we, we don't, in fact, find the one who has the gift of that, which we're going to get to in a minute, and let them trim the bushes because they're the ones who are going to do it best. I don't always get my way or my preferences. 
So what was happening in that whole discussion, and, and I could just feel, and I think they were trying to protect kind of the heritage. Marguerite, one of the founding members there, she stood up, she said, you know, Brother Steve, this is what I think about when I think about us flipping the front to the back, or making the front to the back. She said, I think about it when Jesus told the disciples, throw your nets on the other side. That's all she had to say. Place went quiet. And we all said, let's flip the church. That's the prophet. That is one who is speaking the truth that has been given to her, the insight and revelation for the purpose of preparing the body for service. If your gift is service, he says, oh, I need to back up. No, I'm just going to jump right in and say, if your gift is service, use it to serve. Literally, this word means to serve the practical needs of the body. Trimming bushes. Cleaning, painting, mowing the grass. I see the guys out here all the time on the tractor. There's a part of me that says, I like those big tractors. I want to try it. And then I thought, nah, I try it once. They're going to want me to do it more than that. Service, if it is to serve. And he just says, serve. And it's serve the practical needs of the body. Where do we see this? We see this oftentimes in the lives of deacons those who handle benevolence, those who do works of service, caring for others, going to somebody's house when they know uh, if, if somebody needs to have something repaired, uh, are they, uh, I, I almost said this works across for everything except moving, but even if we find out that somebody has to move or clean out a house, uh, these are people that, that get called up to go and help in that. Teaching. He says, if you're going to teach, teach. Well, understanding there by, behind the word, the, the word in this passage means to provide guidance for what we ought to do. That means, how do we live as a, a follower of Christ? And I think where this area of gift shows up uh, in a lot of places, this is just one area, but Sunday school, so to give you the idea of what I'm, I'm talking about. What do we do in Sunday school, especially with our children? And why do we put such an emphasis on our children? So that they learn the faith, they grow up, and it's natural. You know, my son did and came to uh, make a, uh, a profession of faith in Christ. Uh, I was talking with the family today about a young lady that, that's thinking about getting baptized. A lot of that comes not just out of the home, but what we do to help in, uh, affirm and, and, and uh, strengthen what is being taught in the home, but also providing the building blocks of faith. And that is what our Sunday school teachers often do. And that happens in a lot of different areas. But then exhortation. This is another one that I think gets abused. We don't understand the word exhortation. We think it's to go and tell. And so I've been given the gift and the authority to go and tell. People like to tell. You know when they tell, they do this. Yeah, let me tell you. Let me tell you. That's not what it means. It means coming alongside one another. We come alongside. If you have the gift of exhortation, you're going to come alongside someone for the purpose of encouragement and, and discovering what it is they need to do. I will tell you that where that shows up, and I think that's a gift I have, is through coaching, mentoring, friendship. That's what exhortation means. It doesn't mean going and telling. It means coming along and, and, and providing what they need, just being a presence with them and encouraging them in their walk. Giving. I like this one. He said, if, you, if your gift is giving, do it with generosity. And we need to be careful here because some think generosity means amount. I want you to know it doesn't mean, and it's not measured, this idea of, of uh, being generous is not measured in quantity. Rather, it's measured in quality. And the qualifier here, what qualifies it as a person that is giving out of a supernatural way is you do so cheerfully. You do so cheerfully. You don't keep a record of it. You don't, you don't tell others about it. You, uh, you, you, you're not upset about what maybe somebody does with what you do give them. You give it cheerfully because this is what God has asked you to do. You just are generous. Met somebody like that in the first church we served in Florida. His name was Dan Alderman. Great guy. I think I've mentioned him before. Might have even told this story. But he had his own sprinkler business, put in sprinklers. It, it, it was great. He'd hire me. We'd go out. In Florida, it was great putting in sprinkler business. You were only digging down six inches, right? And so easy, but there were times he'd pick me up because I was going to college, I was going to school, you know, and working the church part-time. Money was tight, so we, we had to have outside jobs. 
And uh, Dan, uh, Dan hired me. And so I worked with him two or three times a week. He'd pick me up. And there would be days that he'd pick me up, and we'd drive around all day and not do anything. He'd maybe get out and adjust some people's sprinkler heads or make some adjustments, whatever. Uh, we'd always eat a Burger King, but he'd always make me get that, you know, that $1 burger. And then we could go to the salad bar and put stuff on it if we want more. He was frugal. He was, he was, he was uh, one of the most frugal guys I've ever met in my life. Uh, but he was also generous. And he had the gift of giving. Because I would ride around with him all day. And, of course, I loved him. We got along. We had great conversations. But he'd, he'd, he'd uh, like, pay me $100 for the day. I go, Dan, I didn't do anything. He goes, you know what? Giving you money makes me happy. And I said, well, I want you to be really happy then. <laughs> it was so humbling to me. But what was also thrilling to me is seeing God at work in his life and seeing him live that out. He didn't do that in a bragging kind of way. He probably would be upset if I'm telling that story today. What an incredible example of being a cheerful giver. Leading. Here's what I want you to understand about biblical leadership. It is service. It is service. It is not just lead. Listen, we do a retreat called uh, Lead Like Jesus. I think one of the best parts in that is a, a picture that we have of a person out front leading. The followers are behind. There's an arrow going back from the follower or the leader to the followers. It says simply serve. And then the arrow underneath the followers to the leader follow. If you serve your people, they will follow. If you love them, care for them, provide for them. And listen, that's what we're called to do anyway. And it's not just to get you to follow. Because <laughs> we're doing this together. My role, and I'm not just talking about my role, but my role, if I have the spiritual gift of leading, and, and a lot of you have that gift, is to do so for the benefit of the body. Serving the benefit of the body. And he says to do it with diligence. This is a big word for me, diligent. It, it, diligent literally means to lead with careful, persistent work. I think it's such a big word for me because it's something I'm still working through and trying to learn in my life. <clears throat> my wife the other day finally told me, you know, you're just a messy person. <clears throat> I had to own it. If you were to see my home office or my home workshop, he said, boy, shouldn't have any tools. I'm messy. I've got to learn. And, and it's hard for me to be careful with my work. It's hard for me sometimes to be persistent with it because of that. And there are days where I walk in upstairs to my office. I'm so overwhelmed by it. I don't do anything other than just throw stuff away and clean my office. <laughs> Finally, an amen out of April. <laughs> We can't come into leading with personal agendas or our own ideas. I don't, I don't know where God wants us to go as a group of people until we do it and learn and discover it together. Now, when we do, I think my task or in the, any of those in leadership, we need to develop a way that's going to serve the body by helping them to be aligned with this purpose that God has brought to us. And then we come into alignment and we live out the purpose of God and in that, we'll have a unified body of Christ. And then the last gift he mentions is mercy. The gift of mercy comes with the same instruction as in giving. How do we do mercy? With cheerfulness. And I think this gift is often found in activities that are helpful, such as feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, or the aging. I don't know about you, but when I look through that list, we all exhibit those gifts at one time or another. In fact, who in here isn't going to be concerned about the hungry, the needy, the aging? I mean, we, we all exhibit those, but God is going to raise us up at particular times for particular seasons with particular gifts so that we can be fitted together so that we can know what is right and good uh, and pleasing to God and to, and to live that out. Can you imagine living that out as a unified body? N.T. Wright, I put this at the bottom of your notes, I think. If not, it's on the slide. He says this uh, in talking about this passage, if only it could be like that in the church. Now, he's referring to something, but, but I think you still are going to capture the idea. I can hear many Christians thinking, but it should be. It should be all that I just described. God gives different people different gifts that are needed for the work of the gospel to flourish. 
This is partly a matter of what we call natural temperament. Some people are natural leaders, some are born teachers, others are naturally open, generous, hearted people. Remember, I just said that we all exhibit this at some level. But it is also a matter of grace, as Paul says in verse 6. God's grace will take those things that are naturally in our lives, and he enhances the abilities and inclinations that we already have. But sometimes when God's Spirit takes over someone's life, new gifts emerge that neither they nor anyone else imagined before. Isn't that exciting to think about? If we just put ourselves in the position of living sacrificially unto God and seeking to grow spiritually and to mature in our faith, God just might pop up a gift in you. You go, are you sure? You will know because you're going to be able to discern it and you'll be able to put it in the practice. We can present ourselves as living sacrifices. We can discern what is pleasing and acceptable to God. And we can use our gifts together in order to be a unified body of Christ. And then we get to sit back and see what God does more than we ever could ask our imagine. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father. We thank you for your, your word, your truth, for the reminder that you give us. We thank you that uh, you have provided us such wonderful gifts that just overwhelm me. The gift of salvation is overwhelming. The gift of mercy is overwhelming. The gift of grace. The gift of being a part of a body of believers that seek after you. Lord, I pray that we would all want to desire to grow even more in that. So Lord, help us to live sacrificially unto you, to render our lives, let you have the rights to our lives, that you might do amazing things not only for us as a body, for us as individuals, but for those we get to impact with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.